nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. This is the Open University. Hello and op uh, open to the Welcome University. Welcome to the Open University, the fake Open University, the pastiche of an academic institution of the airwaves, uh, which I do from time to time and haven't done for a month or so because I've been traveling and enjoying the summer. And uh, I left Berlin in late May and took the train. I always take trains rather than fly, if I can possibly help it, um, to Paris, where my girlfriend lives. And um, my girlfriend is the source of a great deal of happiness for me, combustible happiness. So um, <laughs> I went there. But I also had to finish my book because the manuscript of Niche, my memoir, forthcoming in May 2020 from Farrar, Strauss and Giroux. It's called Niche. I wonder if I have a copy up here somewhere. Um, I did have a mock cover, but it, it's kind of... My mock cover looks a bit like Plume by Henri Michaud. But um, I think that might be a little too French for the Americans. I'm not sure. So... Um, it's going to look different. I think I'm going to work on a lot of different pastiche covers because it's a, a memoir in pastiche and it should have a sort of pastiche cover. I'm just going to keep promoting the book by putting endless um, different pastiches. And, of course, the FSG artwork department are watching that and getting their own ideas, but we'll see what they come up with for the cover of the book. Um, but I delivered it at the end, the first week of June. I uh, finished it in Paris. It finishes, I can reveal, um, with uh, Oscar Wilde. The last word goes to Oscar Wilde, whose tomb I had just been visiting in uh, Père Lachaise. So I thought it would be appropriate and uh, a kind of witty way to end. But also, Oscar Wilde has a great lyrical side to him. So it, it ends with a very lyrical quotation from Wilde. Um, I'm not going to say more than that. So I finished that, and then um, I went off to celebrate um, the finishing of the manuscript by... Um, going to Venice. And it, I, it's almost like I'm in a routine these days because I tend to um, I tend to record a new album in July which is somewhat inspired by my trip to Venice, uh, uh, by the specific things which have appealed to me in the Venice Biennale. So again, I took the train and got one of these interrail passes and went down through Switzerland to Venice and had a week there in a really nice um, funky hostel called um, Combo which is right next to the theatre, the Fondamenta Nuove Theatre, where I once played a concert as Momus. It's a relatively new thing. It's only a, a year or two old uh, combo. I think it's um, a converted monastery. So it has these cloistered courtyards, which are always filled with a very well-picked uh, music. And so uh, one of the, the sort of um, hit of the season for me there was um, this... Uh, uh, it's the Latvian, a Latvian 1980s bossa nova artist project group, music group, called, I think they were called NSPD. Uh, there's a caption here saying the actual name, if that's not it. Um, and some kind of weird little song which I heard in this courtyard. It's very unusual that I'm, I'm not actually irritated by pop music played in public places and, and not actually trying to avoid and evade it. But uh, this, was a, this was one of those rare cases where the music was very well chosen. They actually have their own radio station, uh, Combo Venezia, and so they, um, you can hear it online, the kind of stuff they were playing there. I was pleasantly surprised. So um, I was uh, there for a week, uh, essentially, in a kind of amazing uh, a room, which was like um, a duplex apartment. It had uh, big windows looking over a canal and um, a, a little kind of cantilevered staircase and a kind of rather useless upper area where you could sit and plug in your computer and stuff. But just a really large and a self-contained kitchen, you know, you could you cook in there and so on. So I was joined there <clears throat> when the weekend came around, joined by my girlfriend, Noemi. Um, but uh, for the first few days I was on my own <clears throat> and just sort of checking into the, the, the favorite things of mine in Venice, which are the... Um, there's a market and a church near the Arsenale, for instance, called the Mercatino San, uh, San, San Martino, I think it is, um, where you can buy, from old ladies, volunteer workers, you can buy second-hand clothes and things like that. So I was hanging out there. And also the Alta Aqua second-hand bookshop, which is... Uh, I'm all about second-hand 
stuff, as you probably know. Um, I'm also about kind of cherry-picking my own favorite stuff in the Biennale. And it's usually, this year it was particularly sound installations. And actually, it's, it's become a bit of a tradition for me to really ha favorite Muslim artists in the Venice Biennale. Um, Kader Atia, for instance. Um, and, and for those artists, especially if they've concentrated on music, Kader Atia did an installation which is about Egyptian pop music, which was very influential on my Scobolochus album. This year, it was another, yet again, uh, another, it was a Lebanese artist called Tarek Atui, whose work was my favorite piece in the whole uh, Arsenale show. And that was an installation of um, kind of weird folkloric record players playing a kind of musique concrète just with their needles on various objects, tablets, baked clay, pots, you know. Um, so what, he's a Lebanese artist who works in Paris, born 1980. Tarek Atoui did was, to make this work which is called The Ground in 2018, he went to travel in China's Pearl River Delta, he recorded his observations of farmers, um, architectural practices, music, and then he asked craftsmen and instrument makers to respond to his notes and drawings. And his instruments play autonomously in installations, but the, he invites artists and musicians to record with them to respond. And uh, you weren't actually allowed to touch the stuff. There are a lot of signs around the installations saying "Do not touch." But presumably, he does invite people. And so, what my takeaway from it is that I will do a kind of virtual and unauthorized uh, collaboration with uh, Tarek Atui possibly by integrating some of these ideas into my next record. I don't know, this is what I do. I'm, I'm a thief, really. I mean, w w the important thing for me is that I get appetite stimulated, that I really want to steal something. A an idea is good enough to steal. And of course, this idea of fictional folkloric machines, kind of parallel world of folklore, is very appealing to me um, in general. That, that's really what I'm into. The other thing I'm really into is recorders. And so the um, in the Giardini, um, the, the installation Predictably enough, the, the, the national pavilion that appealed to me most was Japan, which was given over this year to um, an installation by four people. Um, there was a, some videos, a big black and white screen videos of, um, of um, tsunami boulders which had been washed ashore on islands in Japan by ancient uh, earthquakes and tsunamis, but, and who, which just sit there like these huge round rocks on the shore. So black and white installations of these things filmed in various locations by Motoyuki Shitamichi. And then there was music by composer Taro Yasuno. Uh, and then there was a mythological story by anthropologist Toshiaki Ishikura and scenography, a kind of architectural installation of an orange inflated um, rubber seat thing. Um, and that was by Fuminori Nosaku. So these artists have been put together and they made a very seamless, integrated, beautiful um, installation, which was dominated for me by Taro Yasuno's music, which was played from recorders suspended in this, you know, flute-like recorders, the kind of thing you play at school, which was suspended from the ceiling and um, played by robotic fingers. Um, Yasuno play, he, he plays with ideas about zombie music, so he kind of likes the idea of a folk music produced by robots. Again, there's this idea of the folkloric, inventive, um, parallel world. Things might have, who knows, recorders might have been played by robots, or in some parallel world they might be, or in the future they might be. They make beautiful sounds, very plaintive and um, folksy sounds, but um, they're played by these metal fingers which make a clacking, ticky ticky toki clacking sound. So they're kind of triggered, I'm not sure entirely how, triggered by scores which uh, Taro has written. Zombie scores in a way. They're like mechanical player pianos in some sense, but suspended from the ceiling, but not so far away that you can't see the fingers actually clacking on the keys of the recorders. So it's this kind of um, Heath Robinson world of mechanical invention essentially, but it's also, a, it was just such a relaxing installation with a strong sense of Shinto, strong sense of, uh, it was, it's called Cosmo Eggs, and I think the title is what I liked least about that installation, it sounded a bit hippie-ish, but um, the idea was that these boulders which were being, in, which were in the videos had, had sort of landed from space or something, they were cosmic, the music was kind of cosmic from space, 
it was a bit more slowed down. If you if you search on YouTube for the music of Taro Yasuno, it's usually a little more intense and speedy, but this was very calm and slowed down. So there was very much a sense of Eno's discrete music, for instance, in the sound of this uh, installation. And it was just super relaxing on the hot, sunny days that one tends to get in summer in Venice, um, particularly this summer, because it's been very hot. Um, one could just go in there and just lie back on this orange rubber installation thing, which again looked visually held the whole thing together and went through the floor down into the, the lower level of the pavilion, which is outdoors, where they had a big uh, book table with a lot of beautifully produced publications explaining the, um, the installation, explaining the four different perspectives and how they meshed together. So that was my favorite national pavilion. I also very much liked the um, the French Pavilion, which was um, a film and an installation by, um, <laughs> put her name here because I've got a block on her name at the moment. But um, yeah, it's uh, it, it was a good enough Biennale. I, I don't know, there was a kind of, there was some, overall, there was some kind of nebulous uh, a lack of real grit, I think, in the, in the Biennale this year. Some people described it as post-internet, I'm not even quite sure what that meant, but um, it, uh, it somehow didn't have any great political anger. It felt like an embattled uh, spectacle for the global elite who are themselves embattled um, by the fashions of the time. Um, populism and so on, and, and one, one was kind of, there was this kind of suppressed dialogue going on of how to justify this splash of color and joy in some cases um, and pleasure as anything but a kind of adult theme park, which of course Venice itself already is. Um, but that's not going to stop me enjoying it, fuck no. Uh, you know, when, as soon as my girlfriend arrived, we just, we went around on, on um, Vaporetti and we went to various other islands and we looked at all the collateral pavilions that we could see and so we had a damn good time and... Um, that's kind of what it's all about in summer, but it's also about keeping all doors open, keeping keeping oneself open for possible influence. Venice itself is a great influence for me because it doesn't have cars, and I think that's super important. Um, my uh, an essay about Venice actually was in Moose magazine, which was the special Venice edition um, at the time of the Biennale. So that was. Oh, we missed the um, the Star Pavilion, which is the Lithuanian Pavilion. We, yeah, we we joined a queue for the. Um, there's a sort of beach, it's called Sun and Sand, or Sea and Sand, I think, this installation of um, uh, Lithuania, which was a kind of operatic scene of actors. Um, it reminded me a bit of Tino Segal's kind of installations uh, back in the day, um, about 10 years ago, Tino Segal doing relational aesthetics in dark rooms where people would start, actors would start singing, or they'd be crowding around you and then they'd start singing. And that was very effective. Or you'd be led by the hand by a child through the ICA in London, that kind of thing. This was a kind of observation deck from which you could see this um, synthetic beach on which opera singers were dressed as, or there were bikinis and things dressed as people at the seaside. Um, unfortunately, the queue for that was two hours, so uh, we didn't want to join it. Uh, I did enjoy um, the Scottish, uh, Scottish Pavilion and the um, film there by uh, Charlotte Proger who of course won the Turner Prize last year. Uh, she kind of using, she was using drones and looking at um, scenes from the air. I don't know, I fell asleep, it was very calming. It was, I don't mean that in a bad way. I think it's actually really nice to fall asleep in certain, <coughs> certain ambiences. So thank you, Charlotte, for that beautiful sleep I had in there. Um, also, well air-conditioned um, space. This is kind of important because we've, um, um, we've been having what the French call a canicule. Um, I returned to Paris and um, right now they're having some of the hottest weather of the year and even here in Berlin we're going to have 39 degrees on Sunday so that's quite interesting. I haven't really suffered in it but um, I think the, the, the French have got it worst at the moment. Uh, they're having some, I think 45 degrees today in the south of France so that's, um, that's pretty concerning and of course that's the result of climate change. Uh, yeah, what else has been happening? Um, I don't know. I think I'm going to start recording a new album now. I have basically a, a month or so in which to do that. Um, and I think it's going to be called Accordion because I bought an accordion and I want to make music with an accordion. But of course, it's going to be a parallel world accordion. It's going to 
it's going to be pieces which are not traditional in, in that. It's going to be slightly experimental. Accordion spelt with two Ks and with the English ending I-O-N rather than the German ending E-O-N. So it's a mixture of the German and English spellings. And um, who knows what will emerge from that. I want to keep it fairly musically fairly pure. Um, but I will start off with these sort of conceptions and then chuck them out the window halfway through and then sort of revert a bit more to pop to pop structures. I don't know, I kind of want to avoid that this time because I'm, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm trying to be a little um, arty this time. <laughs> I'm trying to be arty. I'm allowing myself to be a little more obscure. I don't know, that's my, that's my notion, but it's probably going to be completely ripped up. I woke up this morning with two, not one, but two songs in my head. You know, that, that thing. I don't know if you do know this. It happens to me when I'm about to make a, an album. My brain actually composes in my sleep. I'm so keen to get to work on it that uh, my brain says, here's a pop song. And it's actually kind of an amazing pop song. And if I remember to, to uh, sing it onto some kind of device first thing, I could get pretty much the whole composition just from, from you know, pre-baked, as it were. Uh, I didn't do that this morning. I, I fell back to sleep and didn't, um, didn't memorize these compositions, unfortunately, because they might have been good. But they, they weren't exactly... They're a bit more poppy. They're always very catchy, these songs that I hear in my sleep. You always think this is just some famous pop song that my brain knows, uh, but it's not. It's actually a fresh composition that just sounds like a famous pop song. So songs like, say, Frilly Military, for instance, which I wrote for Kihimi Carey, that was totally dictated to me in a dream. I mean, often the words, you juggle the words a bit later, but the, the melody comes to you in a dream. Uh, I, I find that happens. So my brain is telling me, get to work on music, young Mr. Curry, or not so young Mr. Curry. Um, and uh, it's kind of a, an exciting prospect because writing the book, it doesn't provide the kind of immediate satisfaction when I write a book that, that writing music does. I get a real rush of pleasure and I feel that this is really what I need, what I should be doing. This is my vacation when I make music. When I write... Um, it's kind of a job of work, and of course there are, there are satisfactions along the way, but you don't get that, that rush of pleasure and rightness, or I don't anyway. Um, but it comes fairly easily. It wasn't, you know, I've written a 105,000 word book, which is now, we now have one year of editing and kind of tinkering with uh, before it comes out. Almost a year. Um, because FSG is a big deal. So I'm, I'm reading a book actually at the moment about um, FSG, uh, which is kind of interesting because it's, um, <laughs> you know, Pablo Neruda got paid the same advance that I got for my one memoir for five of his poetry books. Isn't that amazing? Of course, inflation changes that a bit. Or, for instance, Tom Wolfe. I think, was it Tom Wolfe? No, was it? I think in the 80s things changed and people started getting these ridiculous neoliberal type advances. Even people like Susan Sontag who were um, supposedly modest intellectuals, you know, were actually suddenly very greedy in the 80s. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is a book called Hot House, The Art of Survival that I'm reading. Um, and it's by um, Boris Kashka. The Art of Survival and the Survival of Art at America's Most Celebrated Publishing House is called. Um, <clears throat> so um, slightly kind of, breathless and uh, sensationalist tone to it. And, and Roger Strauss comes across as a bit of a, a hustler and a, I don't know, funny character. Um, you know, not particularly literary, considering these were people who were <laughs> building a publishing house on poets like Robert Lowell and John Barryman, you know, quite extraordinary. And inevitably got, there, was, there were corporate takeovers. And so now when I get my royalty um, and, and advance statements and things, they come from Macmillan, who owns Farrah, Strauss and Giroux, which is the, you know, the big corporate umbrella around it. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, yes, that, the, we start this process, but um, I guess I have a year. The other thing I'm kind of fascinated with at the moment is the Akia house thing in, in Japan. There are these abandoned houses which you can pick up very, very cheap. Um, through things called Akia banks. And um, so I'm kind of, my dream really is to kind of buy one of these houses in Japan and refurbish it, but I'm not sure if I'm quite ready to do that. Um, I, I, I've never owned anything. I, I've never owned a car, I've never owned a house. Um, pretty much all I've owned is like electronic gadgets all my life, and that's what I spent my advances when I 
got royalties and advances from my music. I've spent them on electronic gadgets, essentially. Now I'm, I'm more into buying second-hand accordions and real instruments, which I can pick up cheap in, in junk shops and flea markets. But um, So that saves me a bit of money and saves the environment and stuff as well. But um, I suppose I do have a, <coughs> a dream of owning a, a you know, a sizable house, or not, not necessarily big, but <clears throat> there are some, there are some big ones. There are, you know, 200 meters squared house for 20,000 euros or whatever. It's crazy. It really is crazy. Um, I don't know if that's more than a dream or not. Obviously, my visa state, you, as a foreigner, you can own a house in Japan. That's absolutely permitted. And you don't, you can do it with a tourist visa. You don't even need to have any kind of residential visa. Um, they're so desperate because they've got so many, they've got, I think, 8 million abandoned properties throughout Japan. And this is because of their demographic um, situation, which is a declining population, especially in countryside areas. So that's kind of my fascination. I just pour through these IKEA banks and I, I see amazing houses which I would kind of like to inhabit. And they're often 100 years old. And Japanese people don't touch those with a barge pole. They want new houses. If they're, you know, typical young people with families and whatever, they... They want a new built house and the house depreciates in value. So if you buy one of these things, it's not going to be an asset in the way the house would be in the West. This has, of course, been the downfall of the West that people have tied their um, money up in supposedly endlessly appreciating assets, which are their houses. Anyway, that's all I'm going to um, really tell you about today. That's my life, um, a snapshot of my life a month or so on from the last open university. And uh, um, I'd just like to end by saying Vladimir Putin... Fuck you, liberalism is not dead, uh, is not obsolete. You are obsolete. Um, don't know why, just throw that in. Open University.